carried out an attack in Israel, killing more than 1,200 persons, injuring thousands, and abducting some 240 people, many of whom continue to be held hostage. Following this attack, Israel launched a large-scale military operation in Gaza by land, air, and sea, which is causing massive civilian casualties, extensive destruction of civilian infrastructure, and the displacement of the overwhelming majority of the population in Gaza. The Court is acutely aware of the extent of the human tragedy that is unfolding in the region and is deeply concerned about the continuing loss of life and human suffering. The ongoing conflict in Gaza has been addressed in the framework of several organs and specialized agencies of the United Nations. In particular, reservations have been adopted by the General Assembly and the Security Council of the United Nations, referring to many aspects of the conflict. The scope of the present case submitted to the Court, however, is limited, as South Africa has instituted these proceedings under the Genocide Convention. The Court then turns to the conditions needed to be fulfilled in order for it to indicate provisional measures. With respect to the question of prima facie jurisdiction, the Court observes that it may indicate provisional measures only if the provisions relied on by the applicant appear prima facie to afford a basis on which its jurisdiction could be founded, but it need not satisfy itself in a definitive manner that it has jurisdiction as regards the merits of the case. In the present case, South Africa seeks to found the jurisdiction of the Court on Article 36, Paragraph 1 of the Statute of the Court and on Article 9 of the Genocide Convention. The Court must therefore first determine whether those provisions prima facie confer upon it jurisdiction to rule on the merits of the case, enabling it, if the other necessary conditions are fulfilled, to indicate provisional measures. Article 9 of the Genocide Convention provides, I quote, disputes between the contracting parties relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the present convention, including those relating to the responsibility of a state for genocide or for any of the other acts enumerated in Article 3, shall be submitted to the International Court of Justice at the request of any of the parties to the dispute, end of quote. South Africa and Israel are both parties to the Genocide Convention, and neither of them has entered a reservation to Article 9 or any other provision of the Convention. The Court then recalls that Article 9 of the Genocide Convention makes its jurisdiction conditional on the existence of a dispute relating to the interpretation, application, or fulfillment of the Convention. A dispute is a disagreement on a point of law or fact a conflict of legal views or of interest between parties. In order for a dispute to exist, it must be shown that the claim of one party is positively opposed by the other. The two sides must hold clearly opposite views concerning the question of the performance or non-performance of certain international obligations. To determine whether a dispute exists in the present case, the Court cannot limit itself to noting that one of the parties maintains the Convention applies while the other denies it. Since South Africa has invoked as a basis for the Court's jurisdiction the Compromissary Clause of the Genocide Convention, the Court must also ascertain at the present stage of the proceedings whether it appears that the acts and omissions complained of by the applicant are capable of falling within the scope of that Convention, ratio materi. The Court recalls that for purposes of deciding whether a dispute existed between the parties at the time of the filing of the application, it takes into account in particular any statements or documents exchanged between the parties, as well as any exchanges made in multilateral settings. In so doing, it pays special attention to the author of the statement or document, its intended or actual addressee, and its content. The existence of a dispute is a matter for objective determination by the Court. It is a matter of substance, not a question of form or procedure. The Court notes that South Africa issued public statements in various multilateral and bilateral settings in which it expressed its view that, in light of the nature, scope, and extent of Israel's military operations in Gaza, Israel's actions amounted to violations of its obligations under the Genocide Convention. For instance, 
at the resumed 10th Emergency Special Session of the United Nations General Assembly on 12 December 2023, at which Israel was represented. The South African representative to the United Nations stated that, I quote, the events of the past six weeks in Gaza have illustrated that Israel is acting contrary to its obligations in terms of the Genocide Convention, end of quote. South Africa recalled this statement in its note verbal of 21 December 2023 to the Embassy of Israel in Pretoria. The court notes that Israel dismissed any accusation of genocide in the context of the conflict in Gaza in a document published by the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs on 6 December 2023, which was subsequently updated and reproduced on the website of the Israel Defense Forces on 15 December 2023 under the title, The War Against Hamas, Answering Your Most Pressing Questions, stating that, I quote, the accusation of genocide against Israel is not only wholly unfounded as a matter of fact and law, it is morally repugnant, end of quote. In the document, Israel also stated that, I quote, the accusation of genocide is not just legally and factually incoherent, it is obscene, and that there was no valid basis in fact or law for the outrageous charge of genocide, end of quote. In light of the foregoing, the court considers that the parties appear to hold clearly opposite views as to whether certain acts or omissions allegedly committed by Israel in Gaza amount to violations by the latter of its obligations under the Genocide Convention. The court finds that the aforementioned elements are sufficient at this stage to establish prima facie the existence of a dispute between the parties relating to the interpretation application or fulfillment of the Genocide Convention. As to whether the acts and omissions complained of by the applicant appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention, the Court recalls that South Africa considers Israel to be responsible for committing genocide in Gaza and for failing to prevent and punish genocidal acts. South Africa contends that Israel has also violated other obligations under the Genocide Convention, including those concerning conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to genocide, attempted genocide, and complicity in genocide. At the present stage of the proceedings, the Court is not required to ascertain whether any violations of Israel's obligations under the Genocide Convention have occurred. Such a finding could only be made by the Court at the stage of the examination of the merits of the present case. At the stage of making an order on the request for an indication of provisional measures, the Court's task is to establish whether the acts and omissions capable, sorry, complained of by the applicant appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention. In the Court's view, at least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa to have been committed by Israel in Gaza appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Convention. In light of the following, the Court concludes that, prima facie, it has jurisdiction, pursuant to Article 9 of the Convention, to entertain the case. Given this conclusion, the Court considers that it cannot accede to Israel's request that the case be removed from the general list. The Court turns next to the question of standing of South Africa. The Court notes that the respondent did not challenge the standing of the applicant in the present proceedings. In the case concerning application of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, the Gambia v. Myanmar, where Article 9 of the, Genocide was, of the Genocide Convention was also invoked, the Court observed that all states' parties to the Convention have a common interest to ensure the prevention, suppression, and punishment of genocide by committing themselves to fulfilling the obligations contained in the Convention. Such common interest implies that the obligations in question are owed by any state party to all the other state parties to the relevant convention. They are obligations erga omnis partis, in the sense that each state party has an interest in compliance with them in any given case. The common interest in compliance with the relevant obligations under the Genocide Convention entails that any state party, without distinction, is entitled to invoke the responsibility of another state party 
for an alleged breach of its obligations ergo omnis partes. Accordingly, the Court found that any state party to the Genocide Convention may invoke the responsibility of another state party, including through the institution of proceedings before the Court, with a view to determining the alleged failure to comply with its obligations ergo omnis partes under the Convention and to bringing a failure to the end. The Court concludes prima facie that South Africa has standing to submit to it the dispute with Israel concerning alleged violations of obligations under the Genocide Convention. The Court then turns to the question of the rights whose protection is sought and the link between such rights and the measures requested. It recalls that its power to indicate provisional measures under Article 41 of the statute has as its object the preservation of the respective rights claimed by the parties in a case pending its decision on the merits thereof. It follows that the Court must be concerned to preserve by such measures the rights which may subsequently be adjudged by it to belong to either party. Therefore, the Court may exercise this power only if it is satisfied that the rights asserted by the party requesting such measures are at least plausible. At this stage of the proceedings, however, the Court is not called upon to determine definitively whether the rights which South Africa wishes to seek protected exist. It need only decide whether the rights claimed by South Africa and for which it seeks protection are plausible. Moreover, a link much ex must exist between the rights whose protection is sought and the provisional measures being requested. The Court recalls that in accordance with Article I of the Convention, all states' parties thereto have undertaken to prevent and to punish the crime of genocide. Article II provides that, I quote, genocide means any of the following acts committed with an intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group as such. A, killing members of the group. B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. E, forcing, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. End of quote. Pursuant to Article 3 of the Genocide Convention, the following acts are also prohibited by the Convention. Conspiracy to commit genocide, direct and public incitement to commit genocide, attempt to commit genocide, and complicity in genocide. The provisions of the Convention are intended to protect the members of a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group from acts of genocide or any other punishable acts enumerated in Article 3. The Court considers that there is a correlation between the rights of members of groups protected under the Genocide Convention, the obligations incumbent on state parties thereto, and the right of any state party to seek compliance therewith by another state party. As the Court has stated in other cases, in order for acts to fall within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, the intent must be to destroy at least a substantial part of a particular group. This is demanded by the very nature of the crime of genocide, since the object and purpose of the Convention as a whole is to prevent the intentional destruction of groups. The part, tar part targeted must be significant enough to have an impact on the group as a whole. The Palestinians appear to constitute a distinct national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, and hence a protected group, within the meaning of Article 2 of the Genocide Convention. The Court observes that, according to United Nations sources, the pa Palestinian population in the Gaza Strip comprises over 2 million people. Palestinians in the Gaza Strip form a substantial part of the protected group. The Court notes that the military operation being conducted by Israel following the attack of 7 October 2023 has resulted in a large number of deaths and injuries, as well as massive destruction of homes, the forcible displacement of the vast majority of the population, and extensive damage to civilian infrastructure. While figures relating to the Gaza Strip cannot be independently verified, recent information indicates that 
25,700 Palestinians have been killed. Over 63,000 injuries have been reported. Over 360 housing units have been destroyed or partially damaged. And approximately 1.7 million persons have been internally displaced. The Court takes note in this regard of the statement by the United Nations Under Secretary General for Humanitarian Affairs and Emergency Relief Coordinator, Mr. Martin Griffiths, on 5 January 2024. I quote, Gaza has become a place of death and despair. Families are sleeping in the open as temperatures plummet. Areas where civilians were told to relocate for their safety have come under bombardment. Medical facilities are under relentless attack. A public health disaster is unfolding. Gaza has simply become uninhabitable. Its people are witnessing daily threats to their very existence while the world watches on. End of quote. Following a mission to North Gaza, the World Health Organization reported that as of 21 December 2023, I quote, an unprecedented 93% of the population of Gaza is facing crisis levels of hunger with insufficient food and high levels of malnutrition, end of quote. The court further notes the statement issued by the Commissioner General of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian, Palestine Refugees in the Near East, or UNRWA, Mr. Philippe Lazzarini, on 13 January 2024. I quote, It's been 100 days since the devastating war started, killing and displacing people in Gaza following the horrific attacks that Hamas and other groups carried out against people in Israel. It's been 100 days of ordeal and anxiety for hostages and their families. In the past 100 days, sustained bombardment across the Gaza Strip call, caused the massive displacement of a population that is in a state of flux, constantly uprooted and forced to leave overnight, only to move to places which are just as unsafe. This war affected more than 2 million people, the entire population of Gaza. Many will carry lifelong scars, both physical and psychological. The vast majority, including children, are deeply traumatized. Overcrowded and unsanitary UNRWA shelters have become home to more than 1.4 million people. They lack everything, from food to hygiene to privacy. People live in inhumane conditions where diseases are spreading, including among children. They live through the unlivable in the, with the clock ticking fast towards famine. The plight of children in Gaza is especially heartbreaking. An entire generation of children is traumatized and will take years to heal. Thousands have been killed, maimed, and orphaned. Hundreds of thousands are deprived of education. Their future is in jeopardy with far-reaching and long-lasting consequences. The UNRWA Commissioner General also stated that the crisis in Gaza is, I quote, compounded by dehumanizing language, end of quote. In this regard, the court has taken note of a number of statements made by senior Israeli officials. It calls attention in particular to the following examples. On 9 October 2023, Mr. Yoav Gallant, Defense Minister of Israel, announced that he had ordered a complete siege of Gaza City and there, then that there would be no electricity, no food, no fuel, and that everything was closed. On the following day, Minister Gallant stated, speaking to Israeli troops on the Gaza border, I quote, I have released all restraints. You saw what we are fighting against. We are fighting human animals. This is the ISIS of Gaza. This is what we are fighting against. Gaza won't return to what it was before. There will be no Hamas. We will eliminate everything. If it doesn't take one day, it will take a week. It will take weeks or even months. We will reach all places." End of quote. On 12 October 2023, Mr. Isaac Herzog, President of Israel, stated, referring to Gaza, I quote, We are working, operating militarily according to rules of international law, unequivocally. It is an entire nation out there that is responsible. It is not true, this rhetoric about civilians not aware, not involved. 
It is absolutely not true. They could have risen up. They could have fought against that evil regime which took over Gaza in a coup d'etat. But we are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are defending our homes. We are protecting our homes. That's the truth. And when a nation protects its home, it fights. And we will fight until we break their backbone. End of quote. On 13 October 2023, Mr. Israel Katz, then Minister of Energy and Infrastructure of Israel, stated on X, formerly Twitter, I quote, we will fight the terrorist organization Hamas and destroy it. All the civilian population in Gaza is ordered to leave immediately. We will win. They will not receive a drop of water or a single battery until they leave the world. End of quote. The court also takes note of a press release of 16 November 2023 issued by 37 special rapporteurs, independent experts, and members of working groups part of the special procedures of the United Nations Human Rights Council, in which they voiced alarm over, I quote, discernibly genocidal and dehumanizing rhetoric coming from senior Israeli government officials, end of quote. In addition, on 27 October 2023, the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination observed that it was highly concerned about the sharp increase in racist hate speech and dehumanization directed at Palestinians since 7 October. In the court's view, the aforementioned facts and circumstances are sufficient to conclude that at least some of the rights claimed by South Africa and for which it is seeking protection are plausible. This is the case with respect to the right of Palestinians in Gaza to be protected from acts of genocide and related prohibited acts identified in Article 3 and the right of South Africa to seek Israel's compliance with the latter's obligations under the Convention. The Court then turns to the condition of the link between the plausible rights claimed by South Africa and the provisional measures requested. It considers that by their very nature, at least some of the provisional measures sought by South Africa are aimed at preserving the plausible rights it asserts on the basis of the Genocide Convention in the present case, namely, the right of the Palestinians in Gaza to be protected from acts of genocide and related prohibited acts mentioned in Article 3, and the right of South Africa to seek Israel's compliance with the latter's obligations under the Convention. Therefore, a link exists between the rights claimed by South Africa that the Court has found to be plausible and at least some of the provisional measures requested. The court turns next to the question of risk of irreparable prejudice and urgency. It notes that, pursuant to Article 41 of its statute, it has the power to indicate provisional measures when irreparable prejudice could be caused to rights which are the subject of judicial proceedings, or when the alleged disregard of such rights might entail irreparable consequences. However, the power of the court to indicate provisional measures will only be exercised if there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to the rights claimed before the court gives its final decisions. The condition of urgency is met when the acts susceptible of causing irreparable prejudice can occur at any moment before the court makes the final decision in the case. The Court must therefore consider whether such a risk exists at this stage of the proceedings. The Court is not called upon for purposes of its decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures to establish the existence of breaches of obligations under the Genocide Convention, but to determine whether the circumstances require the indication of provisional measures for the protection of rights under that instrument. As already noted, the Court cannot at this stage make definitive findings of fact and the right of each party to submit arguments with respect to the merits remains unaffected by the Court's decision on the request for the indication of provisional measures. The Court recalls that, as underlined in General Assembly Resolution 96-1 of 11 December 1946, I quote, Genocide is a denial of the right of existence of entire human groups, as homicide is the denial of the right to live of individual human beings. 
such denial of the right of existence shocks the conscience of mankind, results in great losses to humanity in the form of cultural and other contributions represented by these human groups, and is contrary to moral law and to the spirit and aims of the United Nations." End of quote. In view of the fundamental values sought to be protected by the Genocide Convention, the Court considers that the plausible rights in question in this proceeding, namely the right of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip to be protected from acts of genocide and related prohibited acts identified in Article 3 of the Genocide Convention, and the right of South Africa to seek Israel's compliance with the latter's obligation under the Convention, are of such a nature that prejudice to them is capable of call, causing irreparable harm. During the ongoing conflict, senior United Nations officials have repeatedly called attention to the risk of further deterioration of conditions in the Gaza Strip. The Court takes note, for instance, of the letter dated 6 December 2023, whereby the Secretary General of the United Nations brought the following information to the attention of the Security Council. I quote, the health care system in Gaza is collapsing. Nowhere is safe in Gaza. Amid constant bombarding by the Israel Defense Forces and without shelter or the essentials to survive, I expect public order to, break, to completely break down soon due to the desperate conditions rendering even limited humanitarian assistance impossible. An even worse situation could unfold, including epidemic diseases and increased pressure for mass displacement into neighboring countries. We are facing a severe risk of collapse of the humanitarian system. The situation is fast deteriorating into a ca catastrophe with potentially irreversible implications for Palestinians as a whole and for peace and security in the reason, region. Such an outcome must be avoided at all costs." End of quote. On 5 January 2024, the Secretary General wrote again to the Security Council, providing an update on the situation in the Gaza Strip and observing that, I quote, sadly, devastating levels of death and destruction continue, end of quote. The Court also takes note of the 17 January 2024 statement issued by the UNRWA Commissioner General upon return from his fourth visit to the Gaza Strip since the beginning of the current conflict in Gaza. I quote, Every time I visit Gaza, I witness how people have sunk further into despair with the struggle for survival consuming every hour." End of quote. The Court considers that the civilian population in the Gaza Strip remains extremely vulnerable. It recalls that the military operation conducted by Israel after 7 October 2023 has resulted inter alia in tens of thousands of deaths and injuries and the destruction of homes, schools, medical facilities, and other vital infrastructure, as well as displacement on a massive scale. The Court notes that the operation is ongoing and that the Prime Minister of Israel announced on 18 January 2024 that the war, I quote, will take many more long months, end of quote. At present, many Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have no access to the most basic foodstuffs, potable water, electricity, essential medicines, or heating. The World Health Organization has estimated that 15 percent of the women giving birth in Gaza Strip are likely to experience complications and indicates that maternal and newborn death rates are expected to increase due to the lack of access to medical care. In these circumstances, the Court considers that the catastrophic humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip is at serious risk of deteriorating further before the court renders its final judgment. The court recalls Israel's statement that it has taken certain steps to address and alleviate the conditions faced by the population in the Gaza Strip. The court further notes that the Attorney General of Israel recently stated that a call for intentional harm to civilians may amount to a criminal offense including that of incitement, and that several such cases are being examined by Israeli law enforcement authorities. While such steps are to be encouraged, they are insufficient to remove the risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused before the court issues 
its final decision in the case. In light of the foregoing, the Court considers that there is urgency in the sense that there is a real and imminent risk that irreparable prejudice will be caused to the rights found by the Court to be plausible before it gives its final decision. The Court concludes on the basis of the aforementioned considerations that the conditions required by its statute for it to indicate provisional measures are met. It is therefore necessary, pending its final decision, for the Court to indicate certain measures in order to protect the rights claimed by South Africa that the Court has found to be plausible. The Court recalls that it has the power under its statute when a request for provisional measures has been made to indicate measures that are in whole or in part other than those requested. In the present case, having considered the terms of the provisional measures requested by South Africa and the circumstances of the case, the Court finds that the measures indicated need not be identical to those requested. The Court considers that, with regard to the present situation, Israel must, in accordance with its obligations under the Genocide Convention, in relation to Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, in particular, A, killing groups, members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. The Court recalls that these acts fall within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention when they are committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part the group as such. The Court further considers that Israel must ensure with immediate effect that its military forces do not commit any of the aforementioned acts. The Court is also of the view that Israel must take measures within its power to prevent and punish the direct and public incitement to commit genocide in relation to the members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. The Court further considers that Israel must take immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Israel must also take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Article 2 and Article 3 of the Genocide Convention against members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. Regarding the provisional measure requested by South Africa that Israel must submit a report to the Court on all measures taken to give effect to the order, the Court recalls that it has the power, reflected in Article 78 of the Rules of Court, to request the parties to provide information on any matter connected with the implementation of any provisional measures it has indicated. In view of the specific provisional measures it has decided to indicate, the Court considers that Israel must submit a report to the Court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one month as from the date of this order. The report so provided shall then be communicated to South Africa which shall be given the opportunity to submit to the Court its comments thereon. The Court recalls that its orders on provisional measures under Article 41 of the statute have binding effect and thus create international legal obligations for any party to whom the provisional measures are addressed. The Court reaffirms that the decision given in the present proceedings in no way prejudges the question of the jurisdiction of the Court to deal with the merits of the case or any questions related to the admissibility of the application or to the merits themselves. It leaves unaffected the right of the governments of the Republic of South Africa and the State of Israel to submit arguments in respect of these questions. The order then states that the Court deems it necessary to emphasize that all parties to the conflict in the Gaza Strip are bound by international humanitarian law. It is gravely concerned about the fate of the hostages abducted during the attack in Israel 
on 7 October 2023 and held since then by Hamas and other armed groups and calls for their immediate and unconditional release. I shall now read out the operative part of the order. For these reasons, the court indicates the following provisional measures. One, by 15 votes to two, the State of Israel shall, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, in particular, A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Branch, Judge Ad hoc Moseneke, against, Judge Sebatinde, Judge Ad hoc Barak. By 15 votes to two, the State of Israel shall ensure with immediate effect that its military does not commit any acts described in point one above. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Kevorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Brandt, Judge Adhok Moseneke. Against, Judge Sebatinde, Judge Adhok Barak. By 16 votes to one, the State of Israel shall take all measures within its power to prevent and punish the direct and public incitement to commit genocide in relation to members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Brandt, Judges Ad Hoc, Barak, Moseneke, against Judge Sebatinde. By 16 votes to one, the State of Israel shall take immediate and effective measures to ensure the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Brandt, Judges Ad Hoc, Barak, Moseneke. Against, Judge Sebatinde. By 15 votes to two, the State of Israel shall take effective measures to prevent the destruction and ensure the preservation of evidence related to allegations of acts within the scope of Article 2 and Article 3 of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide against members of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Brandt, Judge Ad hoc Moseneke. Against, Judge Sebatinde, Judge Ad hoc Barak. By 15 votes to two, the State of Israel shall submit a report to the court on all measures taken to give effect to this order within one month as from the date of the order. In favor, President Donahue, Vice President Gavorgian, Judges Tomka, Abraham, Benuna, Yusuf, Shway, Bandari, Robinson, Salam, Iwasawa, Nolte, Charlesworth, Brandt, Judge Ad hoc Moseneke. Against? Judge Sabotinde, Judge Ad hoc Barak. I shall now call upon the registrar to read the operative part of the order in French. Par ces motifs, la Cour indique les mesures conservatoires suivantes. 1. 
par 15 voix. Or here, it did have jurisdiction, and there was an urgency that there was irreparable damage potential here to the Palestinians in Gaza, which it ruled was a protected group. So, for all of those reasons, then we have these emergency measures which has ordered Israel uh, with which to comply. So, number one, <clears throat> There was one of the things that South Africa asked was for an out and out immediate ceasefire to the fighting in Gaza. What the judge says the court ruled is that Israel must take all measures within its power to prevent all acts within the scope of the genocide convention and that its forces do not commit any of the act in the genocide convention. So what is it saying there to Israel and its military? Well, I think it's worth noting that most people did not think the court would order a ceasefire. Because by the nature of the court is it resolves disputes between states, that was South Africa versus Israel. Hamas, not being a state, was not present. And so the court did not have the capacity to order Hamas to engage in a ceasefire. So it was not going to impose a ceasefire on one side. Now, what's interesting, though, is it did go out of its way to remind Hamas that it must abide by international humanitarian law, it urged the unconditional release of the hostages. So it spoke to Hamas, but it was not able to do this um, as a party to the proceedings. So I think the court went as far as it could, which is to say, you know, it ordered these merely military to stop acts that could further the plausible genocide that it found. Um, it ordered that these obstacles to the delivery of humanitarian aid to starving the five Palestinians that, that cease immediately. Um, it, it ordered that um, genocidal statements incitement of genocide, that that stop and that be punished. So um, I, I think this is frankly as far as the court could go. I, I personally, I think most people didn't think it would go so far as ordering a full-fledged ceasefire. Okay. Uh, Ken, as you were speaking, <clears throat> we were watching the panel of 17 judges exit that courtroom. We have live pictures as well outside the International Court of Justice. There are demonstrations outside the court on both sides, pro-Israel, pro-Palestinian. There is an extensive security force keeping the two sides apart. We'll be watching to see what develops here. And we do expect to hear comments from both of the legal delegations, both Israel's and South Africa's, following this ruling. So we'll be going to that live. But as I come back to you then again, Ken, for this, uh, for analysis of what we've just heard, this key moment in the war between Israel and Hamas. This is one of the parts people were very anxious to hear, that Israel must take immediate measures to improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza. We know that very little aid has been getting in throughout the war. There was the border crossing opening at Rafah. There was Karem Shalom, which was open. But there have been so many challenges to getting aid in. What do you think this will look like materially, this order to take immediate measures to improve humanitarian relief getting in? Well, it's worth you know, reiterating that this order to allow much more humanitarian aid was even endorsed by the Israeli judge. That says something. Um, now, this is a binding order, but as we mentioned earlier, you know, the court can't arrest people for not following it. But this is going to put enormous pressure on the Israeli government to, to really change the way it's operating, not to allow just drips and drabs of humanitarian aid, not to impose these ridiculous bureaucratic obstacles on, on efforts to deliver aid, but really to open things up. You know, people understand that there's a need to ensure that the aid doesn't somehow mask arms going to Hamas, but that should be done expeditiously. That should not be an obstacle to a population that is clearly suffering miserably and, and seems to be on the brink of large-scale starvation. Can I just ask, I do want to ask about further implications and significance, but as you mentioned on a couple of these provisions, even the Israeli judge sided with the majority. Why would Uganda have opposed so much of this? You know, I, I don't know much about this particular judge, so I can't really say. Okay. Um, you know, President Museveni of Uganda, um, you know, is um, himself a very problematic figure. He's um, leading a, a deeply autocratic government. He's been pursuing, you know, vendettas against LGBT people and others. So, you know, this judge may have been appointed by him, share some of the sympathies. Okay. I just don't know enough about it, to be All honest. Right. I was just curious as we watch that unfold. Okay, let's come back to what next. As you said, uh, this is a legally binding decision, but there are no means of the International Court of Justice to enforce it. So, what do you expect to see immediately from Israel, Ken? Well... Because Israel did choose to argue this case, 
because it said we trust the court enough to, to send our lawyers there to make a three-hour argument. It's not really in a position to say, oh, we only trust it if we win, but now that we've lost, we don't trust it. So there really is a huge moral burden on Israel to comply. Um, I would hope that um, the many governments, including Canada's, that has said, you know, we're going to abide by the court's ruling, we believe in the rule of law, I hope that they press Israel to comply. Clearly, the key actor here is the U.S. government. You know, President Biden has enormous leverage here, $3.8 billion in annual military aid, the principal supplier of Israeli arms. He has been reluctant, he's refused so far to use that leverage. Um, if Israel does not comply with this ruling, Biden should. You know, he talks about supporting rules-based order. You can't ignore the rules of the world's highest court and claim to uphold a rules-based order. So on that point, because they had, the United States had said the case, would, the official administration word was that the case was meritless when South Africa went ahead with this. Again, as we look at live pictures from The Hague, which is the seat of government in the Netherlands, and you can see in this case the majority of pro-Palestinian protesters, there are pro-Israeli demonstrators as well, and a strong security presence to keep things peaceful as everyone absorbs this key ruling from the International Court of Justice uh, on the matter of Israel and how it is conducting the war in Gaza. Again, coming back to the United States, so initially said meritless, and yesterday uh, was asked, as some of the official administration of officials were asked about whether or not the U.S. would comply or how the U.S. would react to whatever the court decided and wouldn't tip its hand. But you're, I'm wondering what you think the U.S. response will be, because uh, the president of that court Court was in fact American and she was a part of the uh, majority decisions and all of these provisions so will there be do you think any discussion of pulling back any of the military aid at all Ken well I think it's important to stress first of all that, that Joan Donahue the, the president was there as a as an individual as a respected jewel she was not representing the US government um, but you know the fact that she endorsed this the fact that parts of the order um, the Israeli judge endorsed you know that, that says something so um, I would hope that the Biden administration really ratchets up the pressure on Netanyahu. Now, I don't anticipate that immediately that's going to lead to a cessation of aid, a cessation of arms sales, but it is time to put that on the table. If Netanyahu continues to resist, you know, continues to pummel Palestinians from the air and continues to deprive Palestinians of basic necessities of life, you know, the medical care, the food, the water, that was you know, eloquently described by the court itself. What do you think this will mean for the Palestinian people in Gaza, Ken? I think this offers them some hope. You know, there is this sense that, you know, the West was somehow ignoring them, you know, that the West would, would talk about Ukrainians being pummeled by Russia or Uyghurs being imprisoned by China. But when it came to Palestinian suffering at the hands of Israelis, the West just sort of shrugged its shoulders. And, you know, this is now a global statement. Um, I would hope that Western governments stand behind this statement. It would really be, you know, I think awful if somehow they made an exception to the rule of law just because it's Israel. So I hope that this is an opportunity for the West to really show that it expects Israel to change. And that, you know, for the time being at least, should be a real source of hope for Palestinian civilians who are very little to be hopeful about at this stage. I'm going to bring in later this morning some reporting from Israel itself, but I'm interested in, in your perspective on how this might be met in the country. Of course, the Genocide Convention from 1948, the world's response to the most notorious genocide in history, uh, the Nazi Holocaust, and the country was established in the wake of that genocide. How do you think within the country people will react to this? I expect there's going to be shock um, because, you know, the, the defense that we heard from the Israeli lawyers is a pretty prevalent view, which is to say, you know, we, Israel, are defending ourselves. Hamas attacked us. There was this horrible attack of October 7th. We're just defending ourselves. Hamas speaks in genocidal terms about Israel. How could we be committing genocide? And this ruling, you know, it's not a definitive repudiation of that because it's not a ruling on the merits, but it certainly is a provisional repudiation of that. It, it you know, provisionally is saying it doesn't matter what Hamas did. It doesn't matter what Hamas said. You still have to respond lawfully. And the court is finding that plausibly 
Israel is not responding lawfully, um, that it needs to re-examine um, this self-defense. It's not enough to just say self-defense over and over. You really have to look how that defense is being carried out. And the court has ordered some pretty important changes in the way that defense is pursued. Kenneth Roth is a visiting professor at Princeton School for Public and International Affairs. He is the former executive director of Human Rights Watch. It has been my, uh, my great privilege to have you with me this morning as we've watched this unfold, this historic moment, and helping us understand it better. Thank you very much for your you expertise much. this morning. I've appreciated it. You are watching special in-depth coverage as we continue to follow the war between Israel and Hamas. And these are live images here on CBC News Network, and CBC Morning Live, from outside the world court in The Hague. The justices, the 17 judges on that world court panel, have just issued their preliminary ruling in the genocide case that South Africa brought to the court, the top world court for the United Nations. South Africa asked for the International Court of Justice to issue an order calling for Israel to halt its offensive into Gaza. The judges are stopping short of that, but the court is ordering Israel to take a number of steps to protect the Palestinian people under the Genocide Convention of 1948. If you're just joining us now, you missed part of the ruling <clears throat> being read out in court, here is the president of the International Court of Justice as she read out the court.